Hey there, Paul Gordon here, the fine art of face dancing, or actually it is fine, but the art of face dancing. <laughs> and I want to let you know that this is my answer to a question by someone who posed a question to me recently. What is the, um, you know, what, why, why do professional artists appropriate other people's art? And there is an interesting thing in that question that speaks to a larger world of information because there is an appropriation and an imitation of all of the other stuff that's out there on a regular basis. And this is not a bad thing. I'm copied constantly. My work on TV has been copied and imitated on, you know, by like quote unquote professionals on TV shows in other countries. All they needed to do was ask our permission, but they didn't. It happens. That's hack amateur stuff. That's why I put those professionals who are actually talented at what they do, but I put them in air quotes because they were doing something that was sketchy at best. The fact is that when, when a high quality, real life, professional artist takes someone else's work and uses it within their own, they are able to understand how to recontextualize what that other person did and make it their own. There is nothing wrong with that. Even better is to credit people because this is not a world of competition, actually. Regardless of what you think, I'm going to tell you right now, this is not about competition. You're in competition with nobody but yourself. And when you understand that, then you can see that taking someone else's work and putting a spin on it that turns it into yours is perfectly fine. And even better is to credit that person for what you have now been able to use because they deserve that respect. You got that good information from them and they may have gotten it from somebody else, but don't, don't claim it as your own. Be generous. You didn't invent that. They didn't invent that. Nothing new under the sun. It's all been done before. Your unique way is yours alone. And that's why putting a spin on and recontextualizing someone else's way is, while still being respectful to them and crediting them is a valuable, honest, ethical, rising above the competition of it and being non-competitive being respectful and deferential, and still allowing yourself to take the credit for your own way of doing it. It's good. It's valuable. It's helpful. The hacks, the amateurs, they will just steal someone else's stuff and then have no respect and claim that it, you know, Look what I did. That usually goes nowhere. There are occasional times when someone has been able to make giant success on their own by stealing other people's stuff. Okay. Um, there's, there's some comedians. There's a comedian in the United States who became, who continued to be very famous. His name's Dennis Leary. I'll just call him out right here. Dennis Leary stole other people's stuff and called it his own. And despite the fact that lots and lots of comedians know that he's just a cheap-ass thief stealing other people's work, 
he's continued to do it. What kind of moral bankruptcy does it take for someone to continue to do that on that high level of being in TV shows, movies, large theaters where, you know, people come to see him do his stuff? That's regard, you know, he, he may he may be a successful performer, but he's a moral amateur. So the amateurs don't have to not be successful, but being an amateur means you steal and you disrespectfully don't credit other people. There's a difference, right? There's nothing wrong with taking from influence. You find people who are in what I refer to as your, you know, your lineage, your artistic lineage. You find the people who inspire you and you bring that material forward into your own work and you appropriate aspects of what they have done in order to deliver yours the way you deserve to, the way you want to, the way you believe in and understand. There's a fantastic artist, um, Maurizio Catalan, is that his first name? I think so. Maurizio Catalan, he lives in Brooklyn. He's you know, got a very um, either Spanish or Italian descent. His work is fantastic. He has appropriated other people's work and made it his own and done it in a wonderful, wonderful way. He once got in trouble, and this is, you know, now here's, here's a debatable, here's a debatable example of something. Think what you may of it, but I will explain why I think it's fantastic. He was, he, he, he had a gallery opening and um, what he did was he went into somebody else's gallery nearby in that same town. He broke in in the middle of the night, stole someone else's show piece by piece assembled it in his own show, in his own space, and called it another fucking ready-made. <laughs> Already prepared. And he broke into that other place and he got in trouble for that legal problems. He broke in. He stole the stuff also. Another, you know, legal problem. Stole it. But his, he's a bad boy in a way, you know, uh, referred to in the art world as an enfant terrible. And his, his mission is to take what he sees and make commentary that spins it in a whole, you know, on a 180 degrees flipped and turn it into something really, really cool with a new meaning. And what he was saying by doing that was people imitate all sorts of stuff. And it's so easy to just churn out imitations. So why don't I take this a step further or two steps further or three or four steps further and just steal someone else's stuff, say I stole it, Call it something that is brand newly mine because the act of stealing it deliberately and reassembling it and calling it my own show is an act of defiance against all of the imitating, copying, bland, generic crap. It took a lot of balls, it took a lot of guts to do that. And the statement of it is big. The work itself, if you want to look at it, you know, focus in and myopically say, he stole someone's stuff and called it his own. That's one thing. But zoom out 
and see what his intention was, it took a lot of guts. It's a big statement to make. It's like Banksy selling a piece of work that destroyed itself. The piece of work shredded itself through a shredder. It was a painting. Upon, uh, upon purchase, and the purchase was many hundreds of thousands of dollars. That's a big joke. Mauricio Catalan also took a banana and taped it on a wall at Art Basel in Miami. And that sold for a lot of money. <laughs> Sometimes the significance of something is larger than what the actual thing is. If you listen to Mahler's unfinished 10th symphony, you can hear it and say, you know, Mahler's good. Now, a lot of people know that, you know, Mahler was, Mahler was a uh, sort of <clears throat> sympathizer with the wrong sentiments and the wrong side of things, but, but his work itself has some tremendous power. But if you look at Mahler's 10th symphony, and you just see it for what it is, you can say, wow, good stuff. But if you know that he had an ego, a massive ego, that desperately wanted to make the infamous 10th symphony that so many other greats before him never was able to, never were able to make, they died after their ninth and none of them made a 10th symphony and he tried really, really hard and he didn't finish, he died. Then you take a look and you listen to that thing in a context and you say, holy shit, the significance of this is giant. Some things, things need to stand on their own. And when you know the deeper story, the backstory for that stuff, it fleshes things out and makes it even bigger. I happen to not feel that shitty work with a big Mac story makes something worth watching. I don't want to see something shitty because it has a great backstory. I want to see something that is great and the backstory makes it even greater. So I hope this makes sense about appropriation because there's lots of ways of looking at it.